think the welcomes and the acknowledgements have been done, but I would just like to um, recognise that while we sit here and we listen to the hardships of children in poverty, I myself grew up as a child in poverty and I think it's really important that we recognise the strength and resilience of our elders and our ancestors and the parents who managed to raise children through poverty. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks everybody. We're going to talk really quickly probably because we've got 10 minutes to get through a project that's been going for over three years. Um, so 100 Families WA is a collective action research project. So the, the project was born several years ago um, out of an understanding that we have families in our systems who are stuck um, and what we're doing as a community service um, system isn't working. So we want to engage families to learn from their experiences about what needs to change, listening and learning from, from them. It was beyond the scope of any single agency to do that, so the 10 partners have come together to, to, to try and tackle this. Um, we have a strong commitment to co-design, so we've had community conversations, we have a community advisory group, um, and we're doing co-design alongside families. And the way we collected uh, data, information, is two different ways. Um, there was actually 400 families, so that was the longitudinal survey, which a lot of our stats come from, and then 100 families were the interviews. So every two weeks for a whole year, engaging with many different um, families from many different backgrounds. When we say families, it was up to the individual to determine what that was. So in terms of children, because obviously we're coming through this as a lens of family, uh, trying to improve the well-being of family, including the children within that, um, through strengthening the collective. 55% um, of the families, so 220 of them, had children in their care. Uh, so approximately half of those were single and adults, as, um, as Colin mentioned, uh, mostly women and the other half were two or more adults. There may, there would have been more, um, so a portion of the, the, the families have had children taken into foster care, so they have those experiences as well. And as Rena um, added this point at the bottom, if the society values its children, it must cherish their parents. Don't even start me on poverty looking like neglect when we're talking about children being taken into out-of-home care. Um, so the background experience of family members, as I said, I myself grew up, um, I was out of home at 13 and living on the streets in Redfern, and so many of us had experienced homelessness either as a child or as an adult. Um, a lot of us ended up running away from home prior to 18, and I suspect that a lot of those families, it was due to ACEs, adverse childhood experiences um, that happened within the homes, because we do know that poverty can often lead to neglect. And of course, 78% of the family members had experienced domestic violence either as a perpetrator, a witness, or a victim. And that speaks really loudly to the adverse life experiences that most of the families had endured. Almost half of us were living, at, in 2019, when the first baseline survey was done, almost half of us were living in public or community housing. Again, don't start me <laughs> on how that keeps you stuck. Um, most of us did not have access to $500 in savings, and so particularly when COVID hit, I know what a struggle it was for so many of us to homeschool our children when we didn't have access to the internet, when we didn't have the tools necessary to keep our children engaged in education. So children already in poverty were again slipping behind the eight ball. So, so what do we have? So this, that was a quick, quick through of some of the evidence. For Trust us, <laughs> I mean, you know probably anecdotally yourselves what families are going through. So we have families who are, have histories of abuse and trauma, who are poorly resourced and facing multiple barriers, lack support options, and that includes being socially isolated, and loneliness is, is a really big factor. Um, often living with um, poor mental, mental health or chronic health conditions, and are providing really valuable essential care roles in our community. So this is what happens. So this is the technical name for this is the nested ecological model. Um, essentially, just think of this as the worlds. So different worlds. This is the family's world. That's where they. Live. That's them, their family, their community. You know, their their network. 
we live in this world, and where we connect with them is making them go through this kind of journey. <laughs> so that's so not only is that personal barriers families are experiencing, but then on top of that, we throw in some organisational barriers, some systemic barriers. We'll talk about that in a minute. So essentially, we're offering a support system that keeps people trapped in a cycle of poverty and disadvantage. When they enter into that system, we really are offering survival when what they're actually looking for is transformation. The sound story on the right, Sam story is a composite of many stories which are very similar. Um, but his journey starts, I think these are big milestone events. His parents falling um, to, to drug and alcohol abuse, enters foster care at, at age six, which was I think 24 to 7 of our families. Serious working when he gains older means he can't work, so he loses his job, enters into debt, becomes homeless. And, and so on, the spiral continues down, down, and down until disadvantage becomes entrenched disadvantage. And once you're in that world, you're stuck. And, and one thing that came up actually is for those few families who manage to climb that ladder significantly or leave poverty, and by the way, when I say poverty, poverty is only one factor. Again, as Colin says, there's much more complexity than, than that. We call it entrenched disadvantage because we have to acknowledge. Um, material deprivation, social isolation, those kind of factors. But for those families who manage to leave that situation, which are few, it's because of their own assets and their own strengths as opposed to the system. The system might may, maybe maintain even in survival, but it's, it's their um, strength and assets that do that. And we need to get better at helping them achieve those goals. And so three years of research, and we've come to the great epiphany, sorry, I could get a bit cynical, about what good support should look like. And I do feel like I'm preaching to the choir because it's pretty obvious what they should be. They should be local, they should be simple, and they should be connected. This is what families are asking for. So one of the ideas that I've been harping on about for a long, long time is um, is the hubs. I mean, this is a, um, an idea that many people who've actually had to access services have said it feels like a no-brainer. I know, so I often use the example of, of the distance between Tranby and Rua Centre, because I remember living on the streets and how bloody long that one and a half kilometre stretch is where there's no free transport and you're trying to drag everything you own on your back from somewhere you can get food to somewhere you can have a shower to somewhere you can stay safe or get some advocacy around housing. Um, what we'd like to see is very much like Hilary Cochran spoke about, about when, when COVID hit, what they actually decided was that people had to stay where they were. So it was up to the services to get mobile and come into the people. And that made so much sense because I know previously when I've been needing to access a service and it's still a fortnight to being paid, and you've got 70 cents and no credit on your phone, what do you do with that 70 cents? Do you pay for a bus fare to go to a doctor because you need some medical support? Or do you go and try and get some emergency relief? We've given the one minute uh, warning, so here goes. We've got three more slides, I think. So simple, um, I spoke about the organisation and the systemic barriers. So just taking the first couple, um, families experience a very uh, a difficult, difficulty accessing information and difficulty contacting services. There's strict eligibility, there's limitations on the number of times they can access services. There's so many more than this, it's just the top line I wanted to, to kind of highlight. We have to reimagine how that support works, and obviously that needs to be done in co design with families. Um, so it, it's easier, it's flexible, it matches or meets their needs in the ways, the ways that are meaningful to them. Um, and a visible in the community. And a rush on to connect if that's you. Mm -hmm. I think that was your time. <laughs> that's why. <right. laughs> so the other thing I guess I'll harp on about often is, is the need for community advisory groups, consumer advisory groups, because it really is about listening to us. We have the solutions to our own problems. And it's the relationships that I'm, I'm jumping too quickly now. <laughs> Doesn't make sense. Um, yeah, co-design is a word that's banded around a lot these days and I'd actually like to see it done 
well mm. and properly, and I do think the 100 families, we're getting there. We're definitely getting there. We really like to show what it actually means to invest in lived experience and not just involve us. Thanks, Sabrina. I think we're out of time, really. <laughs> yeah, okay. But if you want to know more, there's our website. And there's a lot of resources, um, or you can make contact with us and we'll help you through. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.